ready over there? Okay. So we are in Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to, this is kind of going to be the second part of last week's episode or two weeks ago episode uh, teaching where uh, probably a little more academic in nature than what we normally look at. But we're looking at this issue of Jesus Christ ascending on high, leading captivity captive, and giving gifts unto men. Um, so hopefully we can finish that up tonight. Um, like I said, it's a little more academic than the things we normally go through, but it's what's here. And there's an important thing that we need to get straight as we go through this as far as um, what we're talking about in verse 8. Um, and one, one of the issues, one of the reasons I want to spend so much time on it is if you can understand when what happened in the verse happened, it'll help give you some dispensational understanding as you look at some other things. Um, and you'll really see um, it's also a good study in how to look at a verse from a dispensational standpoint, and that will help you figure out what's going on in a verse. Um, again, dispensational Bible study is not something that we do just so we're the smartest kids in the room. It's so that we can get the understanding out of this book that God designed for us to have it. You're never going to get out of the Bible what God has designed for you to get out of the Bible unless you look at it dispensationally, unless you rightly divide the Word of God. It's going to lead to nothing but confusion and, and a lack of hope. Um, the only way to find true hope is to look at the Bible uh, dispensationally. Um, so let's start in Ephesians 4, um, verse 7. That's really where this section starts up. Ephesians 4, verse 7, it says, But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. So again, we're looking at this issue of when did Je Jesus Christ ascended up on high and gave gifts up unto men. Those gifts were very specific in nature that he gave. They were for the perfecting of the saints, the work of the ministry, and the edifying of the body of Christ. Also notice, he, in verse 11, he gave. That is a past tense use of the word. It does not say he gives. It says, and he gave. Um, and he gave men the supernatural gifts that, that, that they would be required in order for them to fulfill the offices of an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, a pastor, and a teacher. We'll look at those. Hopefully we'll get to it today. Have some time, and we'll look at what, what are all those, those offices. Um, Today, men are not supernaturally gifted for those offices because we have the completed Word of God. The completed Word of God is what does that. Now, we, today, we do still have evangelists, pastors, and teachers. There are no um, uh, apostles or prophets today. Um, but we do still have those offices. The people that occupy those offices, though, have not been supernaturally gifted or, or anything like that. They've just they've desired the office. They've studied. Somebody has decided to listen to them, and it, is, it worked out there. Um, the Lord Jesus Christ gave the gifts when he ascended up on high. Um, we saw that when Lord Jesus Christ, when he was crucified, went into the heart of earth into hell. He didn't go to the torment side. He went to the paradise side, to Abraham's bosom. And when there, we also saw that he preached unto the spirits that were there, those that were on the torment side. And remember, we drew our diagram last time, and thank goodness I didn't erase it. But hell was divided into two spots, right? Torments and paradise. Jesus Christ, he told the thief on the cross that today he would, I would see him in paradise. Okay, this was where paradise was. Okay, Paul says that he was caught up into the third heaven. He was caught up into paradise. So paradise at some point moved from here up into the heavenly places. Okay, and there's, when that happened, when that happened, we saw that issue of leading captivity captive, right? Um, at the time of the crucifixion, paradise was in hell. Today, is it, is, it is in heaven. And again, when I say it was in hell, it doesn't mean that those people that were in the paradise side were, in, were being tormented. Only the people in the torment side would have been dealing with the torment. Okay, we saw that when we looked at the... And remember when Jesus talks about 
gives the account of Lazarus and the rich man, there's no indication that that's a parable. I take that to be not a parable, not a story. I take that to be a factual thing that Jesus Christ told people that nobody could know except the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, but the, the, people in, the, the guy in torments, the rich man, was saying, hey, can Lazarus at least just dip his finger in the water? He said, no, yeah, I'm sorry, that's not good. So that lets you know the people in paradise in Abraham's bosom, they were not in torments, okay? So when I say they went to hell, it's not that they went to be tormented. It's just that's where, that's, that's where paradise was at that time. Um, so Lord Jesus Christ led paradise from hell to heaven. He led captivity captive. We spent a lot of time last time in Judges looking at the issue of Bar Barak and um, Deborah and Barak leading captivity captive. And we saw it couldn't have been talking about the cap the, their old captors because they were all dead. Remember Sisera? He, all the people died, and then Sisera was the last one that died, got, the, got nailed through the head and then beheaded and teach you to drink milk. That's why you shouldn't drink milk because it ends up with you losing your head. So just there's that. Um, but um, so then the, the question remains, when did paradise move? And this is an important question, because if you look at verse 8, there's a timeline here that happens. Wherefore he saith, when he has said that up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. So three things happened. The Lord Jesus Christ ascended up on high. At that time, he led captivity captive. And at that time, he gave gifts unto men. You see how those things, things all happened at the same time. When he led, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Important, that's why it's so important that we figure out, we're going to figure out this timeline, and the, the thing that's going to kind of really help us out is the fact that he gave the gifts unto men. So again, the question is, well, when did paradise move? And there's a, there's a lot of different thoughts on this. Some say at the cross, okay? But after the cross, as we just saw, he went into the heart of the earth. Right, you remember that? That this day I'll see you in paradise, paradise. Look over it with me at John 20. And again, I know this is kind of a thick study, and it's a deep study, but that's okay. John 20. Now this is, this is after the crucifixion, after he's been buried. And we'll pick it up actually in verse 11. So Mary's gone to the, Jesus' tomb, Jesus' sepulcher, and not there. But Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping. And as she wept, she stooped, stooped down and looked into the sepulcher and seeth two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I not know, know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus saith unto her, Mary. She turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my father and your father and to my God and your God. So you see, he, by his own testimony, he has not ascended to heaven. The, he, he's been resurrected, right? He's, he's back amongst the living, obviously. G, uh, Mary recognizes it. That's another thing to know about the resurrected body. When, once Jesus said, Mary, all the, her, her understanding, she recognized who it was. Okay? But by his own testimony, at this point in time, he has not ascended up to the Father yet. So it couldn't have been right at the cross. This could not have happened right at the cross. But we're going to keep reading here. Uh, Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that she had spoken the, he had spoken these things unto her. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the, disi where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands in his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them, and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them, and whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, 
was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into the side, I will not believe. And after eight days again his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands. Reach hither my hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet have believed. This is the so-called account of Doubting Thomas. Okay. Is, if you not don't know where the phrase Doubting Thomas comes from in society, this is, this is it. The thing I want you to look at is something happened between verse 17 and verse 27. In verse 17, Mary couldn't touch him because he hadn't ascended. In verse 27, he told Thomas, hey, put your hands in the holes. Put your hand in my, in my side here. So what do you know has happened? There's eight days here. So what do you know has happened? He's ascended some point here, right? Now I'm going to make a point that this is not the ascension we're talking about, but I'm, I'm trying to build the argument. There are a lot of ascensions that happen. It's like we talk about the second coming of Christ, and we use that vernacular, and I will continue to use it. When we talk about the second coming of Christ, we're talking about the prophesied second coming to establish his kingdom. We're not talking about the rapture, but it's really not his second coming. Because even when he came as a baby, that wasn't his second coming. You can go all through the Old Testament, and we've seen that. So it is, it, I, and again, I, I don't have a problem using the vernacular of the second coming, because we know what it means. But what we're, I'm saying is there, there's more than one ascension that happened where Jesus went to the Father and came back. Okay? So some day, say then it was after Jesus was with the apostles for 40 days. So look over at Acts Acts 1. Acts 1, verse 3. To whom? That's Christ. Christ is the whom. To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And, being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. When he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. While they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. So here's another ascension. He teaches the apostles for 40 days, and then he ascends into heaven. And then the angel said, hey, he's coming back. Don't worry about it, guys. He's, he's coming back. Now, what the angel is referring to is what we call the second coming of Christ, because when he comes back, he will touch down. But what I want you to see here is there's another ascension. And a lot of people will say, okay, this is the time. Jesus went back to heaven. He stayed in heaven, sitting at the right hand of God, and he's not coming back. And this is when he led captivity captive. This is when he gave the gifts unto men. we got two problems with that. We'll see. Turn over to Acts 2, verse 29. Remember Jesus said that the Holy Ghost was going to come upon them in many, not many days hence? That's a reference to Pentecost. Now, we're going to read what happens at Pentecost, about Peter's, what Peter teaches them at Pentecost when the Holy Ghost has come upon them. Verse 29, Acts 2, verse 29. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, who is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Okay, so what we've learned today and last week, where is David? Where, was, where did David go when he died? when he died he went to the paradise. paradise side of hell right not the torments but he went to the heart of the earth that's where the Old Testament saints were Abraham's bosom okay verse 30 therefore being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins according to the flesh he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne he seen this before spake of the resurrection of Christ that his soul was not left in hell neither his flesh did see corruption 
This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. According to Peter, according to Peter, David has not yet ascended into the heavens. Okay, and Peter's full of the Holy Ghost here. So, that just adds to the confusion. So let's see if maybe we can start clearing it up a little bit here. Come with me over to 2 Timothy 4. In verse 7. 2 Timothy 4, verse 7. Paul's ready to... Paul knows his, his death is imminent. He says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. And we've talked about this before, what this appearing is. This appearing, Paul... Paul's course, Paul's faith is a result of the Lord Jesus Christ appearing to him. Paul loves that appearing because it's that appearing when he received, when he became, he became the apostle of the Gentiles, if you will. When he started to receive the revelation, is for that the very first appearing, of course, is on the road to Damascus. Okay, come with me to Galatians one. Galatians 1 and verse 11. The appearing that Paul talks about there, I believe, is either on the road to Damascus or one I'm going to explain to you here. It says, verse 11 of Galatians 1. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. Okay, Paul's faith, Paul's course is his gospel. He didn't preach it after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. He was taught his course. He was taught his faith. For you have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it, and profited in the Jews' religion above many mine equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, Okay, that's, that's the road to Damascus he's referring to. Immediately, I conferred not with flesh and blood, neither when I went up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again into Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. Now, for some reason, a lot of times when people read this and make commentary on it, they seem to think that Paul was in Arabia for three years. That's not the way the text reads to me at all. The road to Damascus is when he got separated out. Uh, he, he, um, the scales fall off his eyes. Understands in Damascus what he's gonna what he's gonna do. He immediately goes to Arabia and he comes back. And then after he gets back from Arabia, he spends three years, three years there in um, in Damascus. This is my understanding of this, and this is what I told you guys last time, that I've never heard anybody say this, so if you want to dismiss it, you can dismiss it. My, my thought on this is Jesus went into the desert for 40 days, the Arabian desert. The Israelites were in the Arabian desert for 40 years. They were learning about God during those 40 years. Jesus was fasting for, for 40 days. I believe that Paul went into the Arabian desert for 40 days. And I believe this is where he got a lot of the revelations from the Lord Jesus Christ. Because there's no account of what happened when he was in, in, in Arabia. He just talks about he had he's gotten revelations. Now, he never refers to it at this time. It's not in the scripture anymore. So if you want to say, Dave, you are nuts, you're perfectly, you're perfectly welcome to be wrong on your own. <laughs> <laughs> this is my take, though. He was in the Arabian Desert, learning from the Lord Jesus Christ. The gifts that the Lord Jesus Christ gave were for the edifying of the body of Christ. 
okay? If the dispensation of grace was a mystery, hidden until it was revealed to the apostle Paul, therefore the body of Christ would have been a, that, a part of that mystery. And if the gifts given were for the edifying of the body of Christ, could they have been given before Paul? They really couldn't have, could they? Okay. What else happened when Jesus Christ gave the, gave the gifts unto men? He led captivity captive. Okay. So my point would be this. Everything after the cross, Jesus came. He spent 40 days with the apostles, the 12, teaching them the Great Commission, teaching them to get ready for the kingdom of God. He ascended up to heaven. The year continues out. Stephen gets crucified. Paul goes to Damascus. Jesus Christ comes down. Paradise is still in the center of the earth at this point. Jesus Christ came, comes down, separates Paul on the road to Damascus. Paul goes to Arabia for 40 days. And is taught, and then Jesus Christ ascends back up to the Father. And I believe, my, my take on that would be that's when he led um, captivity captive. That's when paradise would have moved. And I think that's the only way you can put it together with the fact that it, it, the, the gifts were given at the same time. And those gifts were given for the edifying of the body of Christ. Look over at Psalm 142. Part of the desert, yes. Uh huh. It's God. It's God's mountain. Yeah. What did he tell? You know, he, uh, I, I, apparently it's the backside of Sinai where the burning bush episode happened. And what's God say? Tell Moses, take off your shoes. You're on holy ground. Okay. It's amazing how much does happen there. Now, I, now I'm, I'm, I'll reiterate this. I have, I have taken some liberties that I, I want. Oh no, that's not the right way to put it. I have made some come to some conclusions that are not in the text. Just thinking about, boy, he went, he went to Arabia. Well, what do we know about Arabia? One group's there forty years. Jesus is there forty days, uh, and so that's my, I connected the dots exactly, exactly. So. So when Jesus Christ returned to heaven after instructing Paul, he gave the gifts unto men. He also led captivity captive. He took those Old Testament saints to heaven. Now the other thing that, so that, that kind of reinforces this to me is the Old Testament saints, they didn't have an expectation of going to heaven. We're going to look at this in a minute. Their expectation was to go into the kingdom, and in, in this earthly kingdom. So look at Psalm 142. We'll just read, we'll read both 142 and 143. It says, I cried unto the Lord with my voice. With my voice unto the Lord did I make my supplication. I poured out my complaint before him. I showed before him my trouble. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, then thou knewest my path. And the way wherein I walked, had they privily laid a snare for me. I looked on my right hand and beheld, but there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. I cried unto thee, O Lord, I said, thou art my refuge, and my portion in the land of the living. Attend unto my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are stronger than I. This is obviously a, a psalm of David, but you can see Jesus saying these same things to the Father. Verse 7. Bring my soul out of prison, that I may praise thy name. The righteous shall compass me about, for thou, thou shalt deal bountifully with me. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my supplications. In thy faithfulness answer me, and in thy righteousness. Enter not into judgment with thy servant, for in thy sight shall no man living be justified. For the enemy hath persecuted my soul. He hath smitten my life down to the ground. He hath made me to dwell in darkness as those that have been long dead. Therefore is my spirit overwhelmed with me, in me. My heart within me is desolate. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all thy works. I muse on the work of thy hands. I stretch forth my hands unto thee. My soul thirsteth after thee as a thirsty land. Hear me speedily, O Lord, my spirit faileth. Hide not thy face from me, lest I be like unto them that go down into the pit. 
Cause me to hear thy loving kindness in the morning, for in thee do I trust. Remember last time we talked about that morning Bible study between the Son and the Father. Cause me to know the way wherein I should walk, for I lift up my soul unto thee. Deliver me, O Lord, from mine enemies. I flee unto thee to hide me. Teach me to do thy will, for thou art my God. Thy spirit is good. Lead me into the land of our brightness. Quicken me, O Lord, for thy name's sake, for thy righteousness' sake. Bring my soul out of trouble. And of thy mercy cut off mine enemies, and destroy all them that afflict my soul, for I am thy servant. So, you know, when you look at these psalms, you got to look at them. A lot of them are Jesus speaking, prophetically. A lot of them are the little flock speaking. And sometimes it can be difficult to figure it out. It seems like some psalms jump back and forth, and some psalms seem to be both. But you see in these two psalms this issue of they're in prison, they're in the pit, and Lord bringing them out. They understood when they died that they were going somewhere that was not going to be their final destination. But they never understood it to be heaven. They always understood it to be this earthly kingdom. Look over at uh, Mark 9. Mark 9, verse 43. We're just going to make a comparison here. Mark 9, verse 43. And if thy hand offend, this is Jesus speaking, and if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. For it is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell into the fire that shall never be quenched. So he's talking about, obviously, eternal life or eternal death, right? So if your hand offends thee, he's saying, cut it off. It's better to go on into eternity maimed then deal with that issue and go to hell. Go to hell. Uh, verse 44, Where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never, sh never shall be quenched. I don't mean to be a smart aleck, but have you ever heard anybody that says, what would Jesus do, quote this one? Uh, 46, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two, two eyes to be cast into hellfire, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. You see that issue? There, they, when he talks about life, he's talking about eternal life. And their, their process, what they would process that would be, would be the kingdom of God, that earthly, literal, Davidic kingdom that's been promised really since the time of Abraham and as as prophecy has gone on more and more has been revealed about it we call it David's it was it was David's kingdom because it's going to sit on David's throne they were never expecting to go to heaven that was never part of their promise they were going to figure they'd die and then Jesus would re uh, would, uh, they didn't understand it was Jesus they knew God would restore everything and they'd go into their kingdom so the fact that they went to he heaven even had to be something that happened after the dispensation of grace started because God's not doing two things. God does not have, God would not have both programs operating um, proactively, if I can put it that way, at the same time, right? There was, a, there was a time there until the little flock died off where both programs, where, where people were, were in both programs. But with raising up of Paul, people that got saved at that point were members of the body of Christ. Okay, these people were just dying off. So it wouldn't really be right for God to take some people to heaven that had never been promised heaven before the dispensation of grace started. Does that make sense? Okay. And one more thing, look back at Isaiah 42. Isaiah 42, verse 1. Behold my servant, whom I am uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. So I read that. Just Chapter 42 is about the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to jump down to verse 6. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness, and will hold thine hand, and will keep thee, and give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light of the Gentiles, to open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from prison, and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. He's leading captivity captive. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my, neither my praise to graven images. 
Behold, the former things are come to pass, and new things do I declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Sing unto the Lord a new song, and his praise from the end of the earth. Ye that go down to the sea, and all that is therein, the isles, the inhabitants thereof. Let the wilderness and the cities thereof lift up their voice. The villages of Keter doth inhabit. Let the inhabitants of the rock sing. Let them shout from the top of the mountains. Let them give glory unto the Lord and declare his praise in the islands. The Lord shall go forth as a mighty man. He shall stir up jealousy like a man of war. He shall cry, yea, roar. He shall prevail against his enemies. I have long time holding my peace. I have been still and refrained myself. Now I will cry like a travailing woman. I will destroy and devour at once. I will make waste mountains and hills and dry up all their herbs, and I will make the rivers islands, and I will dry up the pools. And I will bring the blind by a way that they knew not, and I will lead them in paths that they have not known. I will make darkness light before them, and crooked things straight. These things will I do unto them, and not forsake them. You see this issue, this is what Israel was expecting, that Jesus was, that the Lord was going to bring them out, and was going to take vengeance on their enemies, and set up his kingdom. Um, you see there where it said in verse 7, to bring out the prisoners from the prison and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. Okay, the reason I went through this is that I, wanted, I wanted to determine when, when, Je when Jesus' ascension was, that, that, it's, that Paul's talking about there. Like we've seen, there's many ascensions. But it's this ascension that, that I believe happened, that Paul's referring to is this one that happened after Jesus taught him in, Ar in Arabia. Because that would have been after Paul was raised up, heaven would have moved. We already saw that, that paradise didn't move in Pentecost. But at that time, he gave the gifts unto men. And now what we're going to do, I want to start looking at what these gifts and, that he gave unto men. So turn back to Ephesians. When Paul was raised up on the road to Damascus. Yeah. Back to Ephesians. It says, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive, gave gifts unto men. Um, and then he lists the gifts in verse 11. But you see in nine and <clears throat> verses 9 and 10 there, he makes this little parenthetical statement. It says, Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first in the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all things, that he might fill all things. It's a, you know, it's kind of a weird saying. I never really, somebody must have been attacking the, the Lord Jesus Christ or saying, hey, if he descended, how can he be, have ascended? Or what, what's, <coughs> if, if this guy ascended, but he descended first, isn't he kind of tarnished? And it's like Paul saying, He's not diminished because he went first in, into, into hell, into the paradise side of hell. He descended into the lower parts of earth, but he ascended as well. And not only did he descend just to the earth or to the first or second heaven, but he went far above all heavens so that he can fill all in all. Right? If, if, he's not a, if he doesn't rise above all things, ascend above all things, he can't fill the things that are below him. Right? You can't really fill the things that are above you. Does that make sense? Okay, and I've never, well, obviously, probably because of the time I was born in, I never thought that Jesus would be diminished because he went into the earth, into, down to hell first, or he was buried first. Um, but that seems to be the attack here. And he, he that descended is the same also that ascended. Jesus was dead. Don't ever forget that. He wasn't unconscious. He wasn't tired he was dead he was dead he conquered death he was resurrected um, we've seen he was resurrected by the father by himself and by the holy spirit he was resurrected by god for our justification he was dead and he came back to life to be the firstborn of the dead um, he's the he's the first one to ever get resurrected and never die again Lazarus died again. The, there's five or six in the Old Testament that were resurrected. They died again. Paul resurrected somebody. That kid died again. Jesus Christ did die and rose again, never to die again. You know, uh, 
that's I, it's an interesting thing that people will say well he was just unconscious yeah he got beat for 24 hours hung on a cross for three hours got stabbed hadn't had anything to eat instead of water they gave him vinegar and then Romans who were experts in death they screwed up and didn't know that he was just unconscious and then uh, he was dead completely 100% dead and he was resurrected so I don't look at it as a bad thing that he descended and then ascended I look at it that, that, that's what saves me you know the, literally there before the grace of God go I I would be dead and I would not ascend you know and and so I, I look at that issue as wow what a, what a great thing that he died and was buried and went down to the paradise the Abraham's bosom side of hell and then did in fact lead captivity captive and rose again so that he could save me and it's just a it's a fantastic gift we're going to talk about the gifts he gave in the men and, and this is not one of the gifts but that's the greatest as far as i'm concerned that's the greatest gift of, uh, i could ever give you know it's christmas time where you know people send gifts now and the greatest gift ever is jesus's death burial and the fact that he was resurrected again for our justification there, there there's there's no greater no greater gift put your faith in that your trust in that and you never have to worry about the consequences of death and sin again he we're looking at this in our roman study he conquered it once for all never never has to be we never have to worry about it again so um but the lord jesus christ could not fill all things if he did not ascend above all things look over at first peter First Peter three and verse twenty one. He's referring to Jesus Christ here. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him so we saw that issue he ascended up what did paul say uh he ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things well peter's testimony here is that he isn't in gone into heaven he is sitting on, and he is at the right hand of god um it's interesting to me though what it says he's doing there angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him so apparently at some level he is even though there are satan's angels in those positions of powers and authorities up there they do appear to be subject to him right now now that may be because though they rebelled they were not thrown into the dark chains like some of them were um but it does say angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him so even the angels that know that they chose poorly are probably reminded of it every day when they're still doing his bidding and whatever the work of heaven is today and they're they're still learning we, we, we've seen about the angels learning well it's not just god's angels the elect angels that are learning even satan's angels are learning and they're learning the manifold wisdom of god the great mistake that they made so um and eventually we will fill those positions of authority and power that the angels do now um so what time we at bill okay well let's look uh, just, just let's have a little bit of fun here and we'll just see this issue of um jesus christ having authority over the angels look back at, at matthew last two weeks kind of would be a, been a different kind of a study so we'll just keep it going look at matthew 8 and verse 28 and what i want to pick up on is peter's statement that the angels and powers and authorities are subject to Jesus Christ. Matthew 8 and verse 28. Talking about the Lord Jesus Christ says, And when he was come to the other side into the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two possessed with devils, coming out of the tombs, exceeding fear, so that no man might pass by that way. And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time come? And there was a good way off from them, unheard of many swine feeding. So the devils beside him, saying, If thou cast us out, suffer us to go away into the herd of swine. 
He said unto them, Go. And when they were come out, they went into the herd of swine. And behold, the whole herd of swine ran violently down a steep place into the sea and perished in the waters. The thing I want you to see here is in Jesus' earthly ministry, the demons, the devils, they were subject to him, which is just Satan's angels. They were subject to Jesus Christ. They understood the authority that he had. Um, look over at Acts 19. I think sometimes we have this, this, this feeling that these angels can do whatever they want, and it, it's not true. They are subject to their and to the Lord Jesus Christ. I think we also have this, I think it's interesting that passage too, they ask him, are you come to torment us before it's time? What do we look at in hell? There's two sides of hell, torment and paradise. Yeah, they, under, they, they, they know where they're going. They know where they're going to spend eternity in the lake of fire, which is going to be in torment. Uh, I think it's, the other thing that's interesting about that is the animal that they go into, the pig, the swine. You ever wonder, too, why was there even swine there? They're in Israel. They can't eat those things. I mean, somebody was taking care of them. Something's not right there. So that's a study for another day. But it's just interesting kind of the, the issues there. So look at Acts 19, verse 13. Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preacheth. So what these guys are doing, I love that phrase, vagabond Jews. It's like men of the baser sort, right? It's just a great, <laughs> great description. They were vagabond Jews. They were exorcists. So what they did is they'd go up to find somebody that was, that was full of the, the devils, and they'd say, We adjure you by Jesus, who Paul preaches. Notice, that, I mean, these guys got something right. They understood that the program had changed. They weren't going who the apostles preach or who Peter preaches or who died on the cross. They said, we adjure you by Jesus who Paul preached. Come out of that guy. <laughs> and look, look what the devil said to them. And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, and chief of the priests, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, <laughs> but who are ye? <laughs> this guy had no authority. My point is, they didn't just jump out because somebody quoted Jesus' name. They jumped, they, they, Jesus could drive them out. Apparently Paul could too. But just anybody quoting Jesus' name couldn't. Jesus had that authority that not everybody had. And here you see, the devil said, sorry man, I'm not doing it. Um, look over at Ephesians 1. Okay, and this, this issue of ascending up on high, just to wrap it up. Ephesians 1, verse 20. Which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead, set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet, gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Lord Jesus Christ was died, was buried, was resurrected to fill all in all. He's all above the, he's, he's above all. He's, when the rapture happens, we're going to go to heaven. Jesus Christ is going to use us to fill the all in all. The, uh, the authorities, the mights, the dominions, the principalities, the powers. Satan's angels are going to be cast out down to earth. It's going to be a time of terrible tribulation down here. No, down to earth down to earth and uh, look over Roman, uh, Revelation 12. It'll be a time of terrible, terrible tribulation on earth. We're going to get installed in those positions that they have vacated and then after the tribulation, God, Jesus will set up his millennial kingdom and then that will be... Now when we say, don't forget too, when we say millennial kingdom, it's not like there's the millennial kingdom and then that's it. The millennial kingdom is the beginning of the everlasting kingdom, if you will, okay? Ages, exactly. It's the ages to come. Uh, Revelation 12, verse 7, I think is where I want. Um, yeah, verse 7. There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. So you see we have Michael fighting Satan. Okay, Michael has his angels. Dragon, that's obviously Satan, has his angels. And prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. 
I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil has come down unto you having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. So, the rapture happens. There's a, this battle happens. Satan and his angels are cast out. So, all those offices, right? Every place the angel, Satan's angels go to work every day, nobody shows up for work at 8 o'clock the next day because they've been cast out. We get installed there. There are grace, prominent grace preachers that I love that disagree with me on this one, but, but if, if the body of Christ is in anywhere in Revelation, it is in verse 12. Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. I believe ye that dwell in them is the body of Christ. Y'all that you've figured out that's what it is for yourself. People, we all, there are people that we love dearly that would disagree with me on that one. But, so we get installed there. Those angels are cast to earth. Tribulation happens. Jesus comes back, sets up that millennial kingdom. Satan and his angels are cast into the lake of fire. At the end of the millennial kingdom, they're loosed for a short while. And then they're cast forever into the eternal fire. Look at Revelation Twenty. Verse 1, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, cast him in the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. After that, he must be loosed a little season. Okay, so he's going to be a thousand years while the millennial kingdom is going on. To be interesting, though, sin will still be in the world even without Satan. So you cannot blame yourself. You can't say, well, Satan made me do it. Because for a thousand years, Satan's going to be locked away. But Jesus is going to be ruling with a rod of iron. Which tells you there's going to be a reason he's going to need to rule like that. It doesn't, it doesn't say he's going to rule with love because there's no more sin in the world. He says he's going to rule with a rod of iron. Um, and then after that thousand years, Satan will be loosed. We have the great big huge battle of Armageddon. The issue is settled. Judgment seat of Christ. No, uh, great. I'm sorry, not the judgment seat of Christ, the great white throne judgment. Sinners are cast into hell. Satan and his angels are cast into hell. And we go into the ages to come. So that's your prophecy thing in three minutes or less. <laughs> so anyhow. Um, Jesus Christ died, was buried, and was resurrected again. Sits at above, above all heavens above all authorities and powers that are now subject unto him so that he can fill all in all in the heavenly places. He's going to fill all in all in the heavenly places, of course, with the church, the body of Christ. He's going to fill all in all on the earth through the instrumentality of Israel. Therefore, he's going to fill all in all. He, and, and every knee will bow at that time, and every tongue will confess. Those in heaven, those on earth, and those in hell will all confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Um, what time we at, Bill? Okay, we'll, we'll call it there. Um, next time, we're, what I want to do, I want to look at, um, it's, a, it's real quick, just look at these five offices, um, what they are, and then we'll, we'll start getting back to a more regular study, if you will, because I want to look at this perfecting of the saints, and, and now we're going to get to what's going on in the body of Christ, and that's what we're going to start talking about. And, and, and how, how do we behave? I mean, sometimes we don't want to use that word, in gray circles, but you know what? How, how are we to behave? Jesus Christ, I just got done saying, Jesus Christ died. He was dead. He died for us. He was resurrected for my sins. How should I behave in light of that? And, you know, there is an issue of we should behave a certain way. Not for our salvation, not even for our sanctification. Just for our gratitude. The love of Christ constraineth us. We should in all things give thanks. That's right. And, um, we should, we should behave differently than other people. And, you know, some days we do better than that than others. And, you know, right now I'm kind of struggling with some <laughs> issues, but we're working through it. Um, but just to go into next week, 
remember that Paul does not say that the Lord Jesus Christ gave the gifts to the body of Christ. He says he gave the gifts unto men for the edifying of the body of Christ. The gifts were given to men for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, and the edification of the body of Christ. They were not given necessarily to the body of Christ, um, though we'll see that the, the offices of evangelist, pastor, and teachers are still there. So I know that was two weeks of a fairly academic study about that. Um, it kind of piqued my interest when we got there because I've often wondered about that. I've talked to several of people about that. and I, th The other thing to take away from that, if you look, if sometimes if you can't figure out a verse, just looking at it from a dispensational standpoint, you can kind of figure out some things. And I don't expect everybody's going to agree with everything I said about that. But there is a dispensational aspect that can't be missed there. He couldn't have, he, he couldn't have given the gifts for the edification of the body of Christ before there was a body of Christ. And if all this happened at the same time, then that kind of gives you a timeline of when some of this stuff happened. And some of you might say, you know, I really don't care about that stuff, Dave, and I get it. <laughs> but I found it interesting. So anyhow, dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you that we can come together and study your word. We know that everything in your word is for the edification of us, Lord, uh, both individually and, and corporately in the body of Christ and, and to complete the work of the ministry. And as we continue on in this chapter and we, we see that and how that's supposed to work out, uh, my prayer would be that it would mean something to all of us and it would it would um, it would convict all of us uh, to make sure that we are um, we are acting and behaving as we should as saints of the most high God as people that are not dead that are alive uh, we should not walk as other Gentiles do in the vanity of our minds um, the emptiness of our own conceits Lord and I, I my prayer would be with, with all as we go through the trials and tribulations of life Remember to always rely on you, that you have given us the power to conquer everything in life. Uh, you are above all heavens. You are you, so that you can fill all in all. And part of that, Lord, has just given us the power, filling us and giving us the power to get through the day here on the sin-cursed earth, relying on you and the incredible power of you and your Holy Spirit working in us through your word, Lord. We praise you for that. We know it's only possible because you did come, die on the cross for us, and rose again for our justification, Lord. We praise you for that. In your name, amen.